FOMO. I had no idea how much money I would make. I had no idea what my job title would be. But for me, it didn't matter because it was about mission. And when I reflect back on my own personal story, it was the luck of bingo that changed my life trajectory. And I wanted to be a part of something that removed luck from the equation entirely and made that the norm for tens and thousands of young people year in and year out. So that's why I'm here at the Harlem Children's Zone, because this work is very personal to me. It's not about charity. It is not about feeling good about myself. It's about unlocking the great potential that exists in this community, because it's similar to one that I was raised in. That's Kwame Owusu Kesi, CEO of Harlem Children's Zone. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens. When the world's spinning out of control, it can be impossible to know what to do and what to miss out on. That's called FOMO, which is short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term and I'm the world's first FOMologist. And this is the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers, people I call FOMO sapiens, how they live and work with conviction no matter what life throws at them. FOMO. FOMO. Hey, FOMO Sapiens, welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to be talking about responding to a crisis, not just one crisis, two crises, with an incredible guest who is going to show us how he is driving impact and thinking like a business person at the same time. My guest today is Kwame Owusu-Kesi, and he's the Chief Executive Officer of Harlem Children's Zone, also known as HCZ. And as the CEO of HCZ, He oversees comprehensive programming ranging from life-shaping early development and education programs to community health and wellness and outreach activities. Now, Kwame's story is incredible. He's going to tell us about why he went from investment banking to running HCZ. And this guy's story is, is really fascinating because it's really personal to him. And he's also a really bright guy. This guy has three Harvard degrees. I mean, who does that? He went to Harvard College for his undergrad, and then he got an MBA and also studied at the Kennedy School uh, of Government. And in the middle of all of that, also worked at Morgan Stanley for a couple of years in investment banking. Now, why did I want to have Kwame on the show? Number one, I think his path is really interesting. The fact that he chose something that, you know, a lot of his classmates, I can imagine, were like, why are you going to a nonprofit why? Well, he'll tell you exactly why and how he sees nonprofits within the context of the business world. I also think what's important about Kwame's work is that he was facing multiple crises this year in his community in central Harlem between COVID and racial equity. And he took those on and did something really, really big. And so he's just been able to have an impact that he could have never imagined. So he really took these crises and he made sure that they could leverage the opportunity to have an outsized impact, even though, of course, we're in a very difficult time. Now, my small ask this week is not about me. I'm not going to ask you to do something for me this week. I want you to do something for Harlem Children's Zone. Let's just go check out their website, hcz.org. If you feel moved, maybe support them, but just go check it out. I think it's good for all of us to know what kind of amazing work they are doing. All right, that is that for the small ask. And now let's get on to the interview. Now, I actually know Kwame. We've been friends over a couple of years. I've had dinner with him a bunch of times. We met through common friends in New York City. And so I knew a little bit about him. But to be honest with you, until I started researching this interview, I didn't know the full extent of his story. And so I wanted to start our interview by asking him this question. How does a Morgan Stanley investment banker end up running a place like Harlem Children's Zone? That's a great question, Patrick. Uh, It has always been about my life's mission to find a unique way to be able to combine business and public service in some capacity. And before talking about the transition from Morgan Stanley to, to nonprofit, I think it's important to understand a little bit about my story because I think it puts into context why I'm sitting in the seat that I do today as the CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone. So I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, I do not have a Boston accent, but it, it, it makes it really difficult uh, at times, particularly around sports, uh, to be working and living in New York City because I still have my allegiance to uh, the Boston area sports team. But nonetheless, um, from Worcester, Massachusetts, son of Ghanaian immigrants and grew up in impoverished circumstances. And the, the challenges that our young people face today in Central Harlem, many of which existed in my life in some way, shape, or form. So when we talk about extreme poverty and domestic violence and a sibling that was a a teenage mom, another sibling um, was a high school dropout, and it was education that changed my life trajectory. My mom played bingo, 
at a local elementary school called Venerini Academy. And because the nuns fell in love with her and understood our family circumstances, uh, they gave me a scholarship that changed my life trajectory. It put me a part of a community with high quality academics, high quality enrichments and exposures, and most importantly, adults who believed in my potential. And so that pathway led for me to ultimately be one of the first in my family to attend college, graduated Harvard College with a degree in economics, and like most 21 year olds had no idea what the heck I wanted to do with my life, right? So I just followed where my friends were going. So that's what introduced me to the wonderful world of Wall Street investment banking. <laughs> it's the investment <laughs> banking FOMO. It is so strong. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so I said, wait, I can go work where and get paid what? Nah, absolutely. Sign me up. And, and for me, I, I, I viewed my time at, at banking as like paid business school that I would be trained in the fundamentals of business and finance, because at the time, Harvard didn't have a finance uh, program. And I would be able to launch my professional career uh, with a strong network uh, of individuals that could be lifelong mentors and, and really be able to work in a, a high-functioning, high-performing environment. Ironically, it was my time at Morgan Stanley that I learned of the work of the Harlem Children's Zone. So much so that Morgan Stanley sponsored me for a year to work alongside the CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Canada. Morgan Stanley has a program called the Ambassador Program, where they choose one analyst from a global pool of apl applicants um, that will be chosen for a sponsored nonprofit externship. The year I was selected, I was able to choose between the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital and then an organization called the Harlem Children's Zone. I said, let me figure out what this HCZ is about. It was supposed to be a 20 minute interview with Jeff Canada, turned into an hour and a half love fest, probably one way on my end. Uh, but <laughs> I was like, no, I wanna work for that guy. Cause it, to me, he seemed like the modern day uh, Malcolm or Martin and had a bold vision for the future. And I wanted to be a part of that. And I very much connected with the mission of the organization. And it didn't hurt to be paid as a third year banker doing nonprofit work. And so I had the best of both worlds. And that year, doing that fellowship changed my life. And I always joke and say the hardest thing I did that year wasn't the financial analysis or strategic planning. It was coaching basketball. Because I learned very quickly it was beyond teaching my scholars the fundamentals of the sport. It was Coach Kwame, can you walk me down that block? Because I'm not good there. So when you think about the maze of violence that our young people have to navigate and how they look to the adults in their lives uh, as stakeholders, as protectors, I got an up close and personal view of what it meant to really be a stakeholder in the lives of our, our children. I had every intention of going back to graduate school to get my MBA. And it was that year at the Harlem Children's Zone that I decided to go back and pursue a, a double master's. So I, I returned to Harvard, got a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and my MBA from Harvard Business School. And I wanted to explore from an academic perspective, this intersection of public and private sector. At the time you hear buzzwords like social entrepreneurship or impact investing. And I didn't know if there was a career for me at this nexus or would I go back to the for-profit sector and do philanthropic things on the side or vice versa. Uh, but the thing that you'll learn about the Harlem Children's Zone is, is very much a gang. Uh, so unbeknownst to me, uh, it was HCZ for life. I had very much drank the Kool-Aid. My thesis was on the Harlem Children's Zone. My summer internships were here. So when Jeff gave me a call my third year, bank, uh, third year at school and said, we want you to come back, I said, absolutely, sign me up. I had no idea how much money I would make. I had no idea what my job title would be. But for me, it didn't matter because it was about mission. And when I reflect back on my own personal story, it was the luck of bingo that changed my life trajectory. And I wanted to be a part of something that removed luck from the equation entirely and made that the norm for tens and thousands of young people year in and year out. So that's why I'm here at the Harlem Children's Zone, because this work is very personal to me. It is not about charity. It is not about feeling good about myself. It's about unlocking the great potential that exists in this community, because it's similar to one that I was raised in. It's an amazing story. And I think kudos to Morgan Stanley for that program. And, and, you know, if you're, if you work at Morgan Stanley, you work at a company like that, you know, I think encouraging these types of things, if you can, if you're in a position where you can, clearly it has an impact. Now, Kwame, you, I was watching you on CNBC because you're fancy like that. <laughs> <Not at all. laughs> 
<laughs> and you said, and this is a great quote, so I just want to tell you what you said. You may not remember. You said, the Harlem Children's Zone is at its best in a crisis. Well, you've certainly gotten a chance to show that this year. We've had two, I mean, I'm sure there are other crises, but the two that I want to talk about today that affect your community up in, in Harlem are number one, COVID. Uh, clearly, um, the community in Harlem was disproportionately affected by COVID. And number two, um, the racial equity and the conversations that we're having around justice in America. So I want to get into both of those today and how you have responded as an organization. But I want to start with COVID, because I know that you guys have stepped up in a big way. You got a $26 million commitment from the Audacious Project, which is housed within TED. So talk about, first of all, just tell us what it was like in the beginning, just dealing with the onset of COVID, and then tell us how you responded. Sure. So COVID is a calamity like no other that we've ever seen or experienced. And at the time, a year ago, ironically, New York City was the epicenter of the pandemic in this country. And we knew that it was going to devastate our community, right? Because in times in crisis, the most marginalized among us pay the highest price with their lives and their livelihoods. So we had to spring into action. And the thing about having close proximity to the individuals that you serve is you're able to get real live data. Um, so we launched the community survey we were tracking the clicks on our website, on our resource page to triangulate to say, what are the greatest needs? And we were able to develop a five-pronged approach to address COVID. Uh, the first was the need for emergency relief funds. The second is this idea of protecting our most vulnerable. So access to masks, thermometers, oximeters, and launching a, a, a public health campaign, reminding folks the importance of staying covered together and staying covered for each other. The third component was bridging the digital divide understanding that internet is a fundamental right. Um, folks need to have proper access to internet and proper access to the learning devices. Uh, connected to that, the fourth pillar was preventing learning loss. Understanding a generation of young people would be at risk of losing um, over a year of school, which is what we're seeing playing out all across this country. And then the fifth and final component, mitigating the mental health crisis. Again, a generation of individuals that will have PTSD, massive amounts of toxic stress, uh, massive amounts of loss and uncertainty uh, that is plaguing our, our community. So making sure that folks would have access to the proper telehealth supports, virtual support groups, and, and the like. And we had a bold vision. We wanted to raise $20 million for our efforts in Central Harlem. And as Jeff and I, and Jeff, again, our, our founder of the organization, started to see what was happening all across the nation, we said we can't just think about Central Harlem. Right. This is going to be uh, devastating to communities of color all across this nation. And we saw that playing out with the infection rates and the death rates. So we evolved what was supposed to be a $20 million effort in New York City to a $50 million effort for the nation. And six additional cities have agreed uh, to replicate that five-pronged approach that we developed because they saw similar things on the ground. And those cities were Oakland, Minneapolis, Chicago, Detroit, Newark, and Atlanta. And given our work in the field, we were able to identify high uh, performing best practice examples uh, of nonprofit organizations that can ex execute timely and at scale and with excellence. And for us, the work of the Harlem Children's Zone has never been about Central Harlem. It is about being a, a place of innovation and sharing best practices with the field. So we felt it was our responsibility to be able to leverage the resources, the know-how, the access that we have for the benefit of communities all across this nation. As you had articulated earlier, we were presented a unique opportunity to present um, our efforts for COVID response to the Audacious platform uh, that is housed at TED, which is a, a collaborative funding platform that catalyzes uh, capital for social change initiatives. And they take uh, large bets on things that they believe will have a significant social impact. So I was invited for the opportunity to give a TED Talk and also a, a five-minute Zoom pitch to uh, foundations and high net worth individuals outlining, outlining our, our collective a national plan. And we were successful in raising $26 million in catalytic funds and ultimately led the pathway for us to actually achieve our goal and ultimately raising over $50 million for our seven cities collectively. So really excited. There's been tremendous support that has been provided to our family. So millions of dollars in emergency release funds uh, across our 70 cities, close to 40,000 laptops have been um, distributed. And we have a unique partnership 
with the Take on Race initiative um, led by Procter and Gamble and other um, high performing corporations like Walmart and Dell and PNC, Dow Jones and others that are that have a bold vision of getting a million devices in the hands of young people all across America. So that's been great. Probably distributed over 250,000 masks. Um, we've had uh, launched a public health campaign that have had over 20 million impressions nationally. So have been really, really excited to be able to step up in a way to serve those that are most in need and getting these resources into the hands that um, are most in need. So have been proud of the way the organization has been able to step up and lead through very difficult times, but the work is not done. And as I, you also mentioned earlier, the Harlem Children's Zone exists for moments like this. Right? We didn't need a pandemic. We didn't need the, the racial justice issues that occurred in, in the last year to reveal to us the generations of negative impact of disinvestment, disenfranchisement, racism, social inequity that has been plaguing communities of color all across this nation. And we felt it was our responsibility to continue to, to play a leadership role in putting millions of young people on a pathway to social and economic mobility. You just highlighted that this organization is really different than probably a lot of people realize. Like, I remember a good friend of mine worked at Harlem Children's Zone, and she's a teacher there. And I, I knew she, I knew what she did. She explained it to me, and it was very different than what I thought. I thought it was like a charter school or something. And I think it's important to focus. I'd love to just have your explain for us why the work you do and the way that you do it is different and why it puts you in a better position. Like, to be able to make the decision to say, you know what, because by the way, like just $50 million. I mean, who does that during a pandemic? So just, can you unpack that for us? Sure, sure. So the mission for us is is quite clear, right? We're trying to break the cycle into generational poverty. And again, put a million plus young people on a pathway to social and economic mobility. And what that requires is what we say is comprehensive place-based services. So first, let me let me break that down. When we say place, it's this idea that place matters, right? The research has caught up to what we've intuited for the last two decades. Where a child is born and raised has everything to do with their future prospects for social and economic mobility. So Raj Chetty's research, um, and he's based out, out of Harvard, basically says within a 0.6 mile radius of where a child is born um, has the most significant impact on their future prospects of success. So place matters. When we say comprehensive services, what the last year has shown us is how interconnected the challenges that our communities face really are. You can't silo problems into neat bu buckets, right? The economy doesn't open up until schools open up. And if folks aren't healthy and they're not working uh, or able to work, we see the impact that also has on the economy and, and folks' livelihoods and lifestyles and things of, of that nature. So this, this intersectionality um, of what was traditionally thought of as siloed issues is now the mental models around that are now shifting. So when we say comprehensive services, yes, at the core of what we do is quality education, but not just education in the schools. Yes, we run two charter schools, but a common misperception of the Harlem Children's Zone is that we're just a charter school. Less than 20% of the young people we serve attend our charter school. The lion's share of our students attend traditional public school. So we have working relationships and in, in presence in traditional public schools. Uh, we have extensive after-school programs, um, a whole set of, of high-quality programs, literally from cradle, starting with our baby college, through career. So thinking about education in a comprehensive way. The second component is this idea of health and wellness, and not just physical health. Right? And one of our goals is we're trying to eradicate um, childhood obesity, particularly if you see the, the rates of obesity um, and overweight rates in Central Harlem. It's just staggering, compounded with um, all of the comorbidities that we see playing out with in COVID. So what good is this investment in quality education if there's a health ticking time bomb down the line? But in addition to just physical health, also breaking the, the mental models and the stereotypes around mental health and wellness. And making sure that our community um, is informed about the importance of, of, of mental wellness and, 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 and well-being and having the resources to be able to address what the research shows, right? There's really um, significant impact on brain development given the existence of toxic stress and how does that impact one's ability to learn? Uh, so making sure that we're providing the proper supports and connections from a, a health and wellness perspective. And then the third element of comprehensive services is this idea of, of community building. 
So that's not only thinking about the built environment and having institutions that thrive and flourish and support the community, but also building social capital within a community so folks can leverage and support one another. It's thinking about the economic environment, um, the workforce development, community leadership development. All of those things are, are interconnected. And we think comprehensively, to me, is the vaccine to poverty. So the Harlem Children's Zone was built to address comprehensive issues. So when a calamity like COVID hits, we think we are well positioned and innovative enough and flexible enough to be able to marshal the necessary resources uh, to attack something that was attacking our community. So that's a little bit about the, the Harlem Children's Zone. I understand the misperceptions uh, around this, but we think it's a, a comprehensive effort um, in order to combat what is a, a multi-pronged and, and multi-level challenges that plague our communities. Now, the work of Harlem Children's Zone has always been about combating racism and structural racism and the things that keep people from being able to progress in their lives. And obviously, this is not new to you. You've been working on this your whole career. And Jeffrey Canada, when he started Harlem Children's Zone, was focusing on this. But something, you know, the changes that happened this year with the death of George Floyd and, and others that changed the conversation in America I, I, I create an opportunity, it sounds weird to say, but in a sense, it created an opportunity for voices such as yours and Harlem Children's Zone to be heard in a different way and for you to have an impact. But at the same time, you had to care for your own community where I'm sure people were showing up deeply traumatized by what was happening around the country. So as you're dealing with COVID, you also have this other huge challenge that you have to respond to. How have you done that? It's been difficult times. And... Again, the things that were revealed in the last year aren't a surprise to our community, but it doesn't mean it stings any less when you see it playing out in live television about the lack of care for, for human life. And I actually wrote a letter to our young people and when, when this was playing out. And what I said to them was, I imagine that you're going through a host of emotions. I am too. And I don't want to pretend that I know exactly what you're going through, but let me describe the roller coaster of emotions that I'm going through, right? I'm trying to balance the rage, the anger, the despair, the sadness that I'm feeling with the responsibility that I have as a leader, not only for this organization, but for my household. And that having to be that sense of st stability and, and power and support for so many others that are depending on me. And it's been really tough. And I don't want to deny that I'm going through those roller coaster of emotions, similar to that I imagine our young people are. But the thing I wanted to be crystal clear about is know that I love you, right? Know that your life matters. Know that it is okay to not be okay, but know that you have such power in your voice and actions to be able to charter a different path for us for the future, because we are relying on you all to be the future leaders of this country uh, that will lead us into better times. So it was really important for us not to avoid having the conversation with our young people, to empower them, to let them know it is okay to feel these hosts of emotions, but how do you channel that energy in productive ways that allows us to create a new narrative. And you mentioned the term opportunity, right? There is a unique opportunity now where the collective consciousness of this nation has now risen to a level that it's primed for action. But that's not going to always exist. So we need organizations like the Harlem Children's Zone and so many other high performing organizations ac across the, this nation to be able to show a different pathway forward, right? And it's my hope that the evidence, the two decades worth of evidence that we have can break mental models around race, around racial equity, around what is possible in these communities. Like I said, I am like the children that we serve. And oftentimes when people have conversations with me, they think my story begins with Harvard, right? So then automatically they think it begins with privilege. And if you can connect with me through my educational professional journey, and then you learn that I am actually the same as the young people that we serve, then you should be able to connect with our community as well. So I, I feel that I have been blessed and privileged with an awesome opportunity, given my lived experience, to sit in the seat of CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone and really 
force the conversation and lead the conversation across the nation that will allow us to marshal the necessary resources to be able to effectively execute on comprehensive services because we know the model works. We know that it is effective. And since we know it works, we have a responsibility to replicate that model all across this nation. You just mentioned the term high performing organization. And I can almost imagine, I'm just trying to like imagine that the first day you show up with your Morgan Stanley, you know, whatever financial models and, and that kind of mindset, uh, it was probably a shock for you maybe, or maybe not. You'll tell me that you're that, and now in a, in an environment that has totally different metrics, totally different stakeholders than, you know, a bank. But at the same time, you know, you bring to the table a lot of the business acumen uh, that you have developed over the years. So when you think about being the CEO of a organization like HCZ, like where, where is the line between, you know, quote unquote, nonprofit or social enterprise, and then thinking like any other business person? I wholeheartedly believe I'm running a business, right? The legal entity of the organization doesn't determine the the quality or the skills required to execute on a bold vision. And I have this conversation a lot with my classmates. If I blindfolded you and said, hey, you have the opportunity in a, at a young age to be in the leadership role of an organization that has 1,800 plus employees, 22,000 plus clients, the decisions that you make could have life or death implications on an entire community. You'll get to meet with heads of states and titans of industry, multi-million dollar budget, significant opportunities to, to fundraise, unique problems that's gonna require you building a culture of innovation. Would you take the job? Absolutely. So the skills that are required to have high quality work, right, because we're never going to negotiate what the bar of excellence is going to be, are still the same fundamental pillars that we learned in business. Customer service, good governance, strategic problem solving and decision making, uh, the ability to fundraise and, and, and manage a budget and the finances appropriately, strong communication, having a clear articulation of mission and alignment between action and statements, clear values and displaying those values. All of those stuff are critical elements that we've been taught in business, which is things that I have to use on a daily basis here. So I think oftentimes there are mental models of, oh, you're a nonprofit. Oh, you must love the kids. Yes, I love the kids, but it's not enough to just love the kids. I have to have the skills, the 1800 plus staff members have to have the skills to be able to deliver with excellence. If you think about the quality of services that you would demand for anybody in your own family, is the same level of quality that we need to deliver for our community. There's no negotiating that, again, because you have a nonprofit label. So that's why you hear me say the term high performing organization. It is that unwavering um, commitment to never settling for mediocrity, continuing to raise that bar of excellence. And there is no delineation between for-profit, non-profit for me in that perspective when it when you talk about the skills re required to get the job done. All right. If you want to learn more about the Harlem Children's Zone, you can go to hcz.org. Kwame Owusu-Kesi, thanks so much for being here. Patrick, thank you so much. I appreciate the time. FOMO. Big news, we now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show and find out how to advertise. Also head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrom. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.